So today we have two parables in our ongoing study of the book of Luke. We have the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. They are similar and they make the same point. And we'll talk about what that point is here in a little while. And next week we have a third parable that is similar. I have to admit, I thought about doing all three, doing just the whole chapter together because next week we have the parable of the prodigal son. And it's a similar parable. It's meant to go together. But we'll talk about some different nuances that we find with the prodigal son. But when it comes to uh, this thought of the lost sheep, that we are sheep and he is our shepherd, that is something that is beloved by many Christians. It's one of the reasons that I believe when you ask people what their favorite psalm is, most of the time you get Psalms 23. It's either that they really love that picture or that's the only psalm they know. It's one of those two. And so they, so they say Psalms 23 is their favorite psalm. But I've heard a lot of studies over the years that have us compared to sheep. And usually they go something like this. Sheep are dumb and God compared us to sheep. Sheep will follow each other off the cliff and God compared us to sheep. So we need a shepherd because we're dumb. Now, I don't know that that's really the point they're trying to make, but I can tell you that I get tired of those kind of studies. Uh, we are compared to sheep because we need a shepherd. We need a shepherd and he is our shepherd. He is the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, Psalms 23. He leads us beside still waters. He, he takes care of us. And it, that's why I believe it is extremely, an, an extremely ben, beloved analogy and why this parable becomes so strong. Uh, I want to, first of all, before we get into this parable, these two parables, I want to talk to you about why Jesus spoke in parables, first of all. There are 55 parables in the New Testament, which is kind of a large number of parables. Some of them are similar, but come to a different point. Jesus used similar stories to make different points with the parables, but there's 55 distinct, unique parables in the New Testament. So if you're going to do a study of the parables, you're going to be covering 55 of them. Now, when Jesus began his ministry, he didn't speak in parables. When you look at the early teachings of Jesus, he taught plainly. A great example of this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is the first year of his ministry. Uh, and we've got those three chapters. There's no parables in it. It's all just very direct. But there came a point when to the crowds, he only spoke in parables. There was a point in his ministry where he would teach his disciples plainly by themselves, but to the crowds, he spoke in parables. Well, the disciples recognized this. They noticed it. And so they asked Jesus, why are you teaching in parables? And this is in Matthew 13, it's after Jesus gave the parable of the sower and then he goes privately and explains to them what the parable is about. And then afterwards, here's what they say. Verse uh, 13, excuse me, verse 10 of Matthew chapter 13. They should bring this up on the screen for you. And the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak in parables? Th there's a place that says where they ask, why do you only speak to the crowds in parables? So we know that he restricted it for that reason. He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Now his answer sounds a little random, doesn't it? Because you guys have been chosen and these guys have not been. But there's a reason they have been chosen and the others have not been. There's something going on inside of them that allows them to be able to get plain, clear teaching from Jesus and something going inside of those in public that do not allow them for Jesus to tell them plainly. And as he goes on here, he explains that. He says, um, but to them, it has not been given. And then for whoever has, to him more will be given and will have abundance. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. So to those that are receiving it, they're just going to receive more and more. The more we learn from God and God's principles, the richer we become spiritually. The more we can understand it and don't understand it, the less we're going to receive. Pretty clear. Then he says, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. This is the reason he gave. I'm speaking to them in parables 
Because even though they hear, they're not hearing. Even though they see, they're not seeing. Even though I'm teaching them, they're not understanding. This isn't, this isn't just a fault that they have that they can't quite get it. They are passive listeners. They are not ready to obey. They're just kind of, you know, hearing Jesus. He's a miracle worker. Crowds are following him. They aren't really interested in what is Jesus telling us so that I can live it. Quite frankly, I think the same thing happens in church. I think we come into a place like this and we can be a passive listener or we can be an active listener. And from my perspective, I can see it. And you guys should know that because, you know, if you just don't look at the screens, but just look at me and can you just look at my body language, tell me what you think. <laughs> You're looking at me, right? So it works the other way around as well. I can tell when, when there's, there's just passive listeners and, and I know they're getting nothing from it, not because they're just not ready to receive it. But I can also tell when people are eager to hear God's word and do what it says. I can, and, and by the way, that's the vast majority of you, just so you know. The vast majority of you, I can see the eagerness and the hunger to receive what God says. And so Jesus says, look, if you're gonna be passive, why should I, why should I give you the information? There's an Old Testament passage where God says this. My people constantly put things in front of them that cause them to sin. The, the context of that is idols. My people constantly put things in front of them that cause them to sin. Should I allow myself to be heard from, uh, of by them? Should I allow myself to be heard by them? God's saying, if they're not serious, should I allow myself to be heard by them? And I think that's a good question for today. And what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about the parables, if you're not serious, why should God communicate to you a spiritual truth? But if you're serious, he wants to, and he's ready to. Now, he gets into details as to what their problem is. He talks about them fulfilling the, the prophecy of Isaiah. And in Isaiah, it tells us what their problem is. We find that there's three of them. It says, and in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing, you will hear and not understand, and seeing, you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of these people have grown dull, the ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. God says this is a fulfillment of Isaiah because they have dull hearts, ears that don't hear, and they're purposely closing their eyes. They want the miracles. They want the food Jesus brings, but they don't want to do what he says. They don't want to be obedient to him. They have dull hearts. And so God needs to do some, some heart surgery on some of us. You say, I go to church and I don't receive anything, but we're studying God's word every week. It, 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 it becomes uh, an idea of whether or not you're going to receive from him. And I believe that if you come to church with a sense of anticipation and expectation, I believe that you will receive from God. And it doesn't matter to me whether or not the preacher's boring or not. He might, you know, <laughs> try to think of a boring joke, but he might be really boring. <laughs> and you could still receive from God's word because it's God's word and it's rich and God speaks through his word. His spirit moves through his word. And so that was their three problems. And then he says after this, they're, you know, they have, their, their eyes are shut, they can't hear, their hearts are dull. So he says, so that I should tell them, and then he says, uh, but blessed are the eyes for you, they see, for your eyes for they see. They were eager. And your ears for they hear. For assuredly I say to you, many prophets and righteous men have a desire to see what you see and did not see it and hear what you hear and did not hear it. Now that's true for the disciples, right? We would have loved to have been one of the disciples and sit and listen to the teaching of Jesus. That'd have been awesome. But we also live in a time where we have more access to tools to study our Bible, more access to the manuscripts, more access to the original languages than at any other time. And just a bit of, if you are having trouble studying the Bible, Make a list of things you're interested in. What are, what are you interested in? And study those things. I, I think that you'll have a passion as you do and you'll learn that the Bible clearly speaks. And so this is the reason that he spoke in parables. It's interesting. We say, well, he spoke in parables to make spiritual truths more clear. Yes, that's what happens. 
but he spoke in parables to hide things from people. Now, I have two passages that help us understand this, one in the New Testament and one in the Old Testament. The one in the New Testament says this. It's, a, it's Hebrews eleven six. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder for those who diligently seek him. So God rewards those who are diligent in their seeking. God does not re reward passive seeking. God rewards diligent seeking. The, the, the second passage in the Old Testament is like it. And it's Jeremiah 29, verse 13. And you will seek for me, God says, and find me when you search for me with all of your hearts. Again, there is that diligent aspect to it. You want to receive from God. You want to grow. You want to learn his word. You want to have God reveal to you new spiritual truths from his word. Then you want to have a diligent heart. Okay, so let's come now to this first parable. This parable is spoken for those very reasons. And we get the setting for the terrible, for the terrible. We get the setting for the parable. It's not a terrible parable. We get a setting for the parable in verses one through three. He says, then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. Now, if you've been with us in our study through the book of Luke, you know that Jesus was having a meal with a religious leader and Pharisees. And what we've talked about the last few weeks has been Jesus' Jesus's response to that meal because he made it awkward immediately. Remember, a couple of times he said a couple of different things that made it awkward. And um, so now he leaves. And when he leaves, a crowd follows him. And he, this is our study last week. He turns around to the crowd and he says, you want to follow me? Then, then lay down your life and pick up your cross and follow me. You want to be my disciple? Then deny yourself and, and follow me. And so he laid down some very heavy rules about being a disciple. And you would think that when someone lays down heavy rules about what it means to be a disciple, that that might cause people to shrink back. People might go, well, that's too much. I, I don't want to pick up my cross and follow him. What does that mean anyway? I don't want to I don't, I don't want to have to live wholeheartedly for him, so I'm going to back away. But I found it to be the opposite. I found that when we talk about what it really takes to be a Christian and to be close to Jesus, people are more responsive to that than they are when you try to make it more palatable. There's a temptation for pastors to make the message of Jesus more palatable. We think we need to help Jesus out. This is a message to all us preachers and me, my, myself as well, Jesus doesn't need my help. What he needs me to do is just honestly represent him. Jesus is okay without me going, I think I can, I think I can tweak his message a little bit. I think I can make it better. I think I can help him. When you give Jesus his message, even when it's a hard message to hear, people respond. So Jesus turns around, tells the crowd, follow me, you're gonna have to do all these things. The next thing you know, he's got a bunch of tax collectors and sinners that he's eating with. He's having a meal with tax collectors and sinners. These, these, and I don't need to go through a list of, of what tax collectors and sinners are, do I? These are partiers. These are people that have been trapped in addictions. These are people that have been trapped in sexual sin. Uh, these are people that just have had all of these things in their lives. And suddenly they're at a meal with Jesus because Jesus hung out with tax collectors and sinners and called tax collectors and sinners. He goes from a meal with the scribes and Pharisees to a meal with tax collectors and sinners. I love it. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained. Of course they did. Because what else do Pharisees and scribes do? This man received sinners to eat with them, and he spoke a parable to them, saying. So he's going to give this parable. And what we're going to see is something very unique. I don't know how you feel when you meet someone that has been deceived by sin and the obvious destruction of sin has, has, is evident in their lives. But I know how Jesus felt. Jesus saw people trapped by the chains of sin. He didn't, he didn't judge them awful, horrible people, sinners. That wasn't Jesus. He was like, they're trapped in this. Sin has got them and I want to deliver them. God's in the business of delivering people from sin. And if you're here and your life is spiraling out of control because of addiction or, or, or because of sexual sin and it just seems like you're heading for a crash, come to the Savior because he loves you and he wants to set you free from that which would bring destruction into your life. And so he tells them a parable and it's the parable of the lost sheep. 
He says in verse 4, What men of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness? Now, a couple of things already. Number one, how did he lose the sheep? What, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them? Jesus is the good shepherd. How does he lose a sheep? Is the shepherd like looking the other way, not really paying attention to all the sheep, and he lost one of them? Matthew gives us a little bit more information. It's a parallel passage. It's the same parable told by Matthew. And Matthew says he lost one of the sheep because it went astray. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 6, all we are like sheep. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid upon him, that's Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Again, we see the way that God deals with sin among all of us being sheep that are prone to go astray by laying on him, on him the iniquity of us all. And so whether or not you've ever had a commitment with Christ, you've, you've run from him your entire life, or you actually knew him and walked away from him, the outcome is the same. You are apart from him. And Jesus says that you leave the 99 in the wilderness, which to me doesn't seem like a very smart thing for a shepherd to do. I've lost one of my sheep. Let me go ahead and leave these guys here and go find that one. But Jesus is making a point that he will go after the apostate. He will go after the one who walks away. He will go after the person who is deconstructing their faith. And if that's you, whether it's because you've, you've, you're running from him and want to be involved in sin, or whether it's because you've decided, I just don't believe anymore and I just don't know if I believe. So I'm not going to follow God anymore. God is going to come after you. And I've got to tell you, I love that. I love it because God came after me. I, unfortunately, at 18 years old, walked away from the Lord. It's interesting, when I was, I met him on almost 13. When I was 16 or 17 years old, I knew a couple of people that walked away from God and I judged them. How could they do that? I would never do that. Those are famous last words, by the way. When you look at what someone does and goes, I, I will never do that. And I ended up walking away. But here's my experience, and I'm not going to go into detail this morning. I will at another point. I have in the past. God came after me, though. God came after me. I know he loves me and wants me because he came after me. Now, he took everything away from me, and I'm glad he did because he came after me. And I have that in my life that I can look back and I know, I know, I know he came after me and he's going to come after you as well. And I can tell you for those that are, are, are now deconstructed or apostate or trapped in sin, that I pray the same way for them. And scary when it's someone you love. Lord, do whatever you have to do to bring them back. But because you love them, you pray that prayer. And we might be scared of what God would do, but God might need to do what he's got to do. He might need to do something really, really severe in order to bring that person back. But he says, I'll leave the 99 and go after the one. And if you go, well, I don't want him to do severe things to bring me back, then come back. Come back now. You don't have to wait. You don't have to go through the whole process. The prodigal son, that, that's what happened to him. That's next week, by the way, so I don't want to get too into it. But the prodigal son got all of his money, spent it on riotous living, what a picture of sin, right? Riotous living. Didn't have any money. All of a sudden, <laughs> money, food, booze, everything for everybody. Riotous living. And then when he lost it all, he didn't have any friends. And he's in the pig pen. The Bible says when he wants to fill his stomach with the food he was feeding the pigs, with the slop, that he says, I'll go back to my father. He was at the very bottom. If you find yourself in the pig pen, you can always go back to your father. He'll always receive you. Now, how does God feel when you come back? How does God, how did God feel about me when I came back? We have earthly fathers and, and they're supposed to be an analogy of our heavenly father. And I like to encourage you dads here, treat your kids like God treats us. It's gonna help them in the future to know. Be gracious to your kids. Be kind to your kids. Be like God to your kids. I had a dad who wasn't that way. I had a dad who was a strict disciplinarian. His dad was a strict disciplinarian. My dad was. My dad was an over-disciplinary. He, he disciplined us to the point of abuse. 
It's funny, when you grow up in an abusive family, it's normalized to you. I never knew it was abusive. I just thought this is life. But once I got, I, I was 18 years old. My dad had been dead for about five years. And I remember thinking, I had this thought, kind of learning now how dads treat kids. My dad was a jerk. It just dawned on me all of a sudden. My dad was a jerk. If you are, if you're treating your kids poorly, if you're being a jerk to your kids, there's going to come a day that there's a revelation. They're going to realize my dad was a jerk. So, so my dad would once, if I did something wrong, he would punish us, which is right. Discipline is important. He'd punish us or over punish us. And then he would say to me, you're in trouble, which meant I wasn't going to get to do the things the family got to do. We're going for ice cream, but not you, Robert, because you're still in trouble. It's funny, my sister never seemed to get in that much trouble. I'm a little bitter still all these years later. But, but I would be in trouble with my dad for, it seemed to me, I don't really know how long it was, but for weeks it would seem to me. It would take me a long time so I wasn't in trouble anymore. So I'd, I'd come in and say something to my dad. He'd go, well, you're still in trouble. Don't think you're not out of trouble. You're still in trouble. So I thought I was in trouble with God. I, when, I, when I would sin, I would think that God... I was in trouble. It took me a long time to learn that my dad wasn't a good representative of God. And God is much more like my father-in-law, for my, way, my late wife, Lisa. He was, a, he was a lieutenant colonel in the Marines. He is 6'4", 6'5", very much like a John Wayne character. Looked like John Wayne. One time, he got mad at me and he shook his fist at me. He said, you want to fight me? <laughs> I, I was like, no, Keith, no. I'm good. I'm fine right now. I think he was 70 years old and I was like 35. No, still, no, I don't, no. I, I don't, I don't want to fight you. One punch, it'll be all over. But one thing that he would do, he got upset at me one time and, and, and gave me a talking to, which was not, that's not hard for a lieutenant colonel in the Marines to do, by the way. They're pretty good at it. So he's upset at me, gives me a talking to. And then he says to me, now we're okay. I want you to know that you and me were Okay. This isn't going to go on from here. We're, this, we've talked about it. It's done. We're okay. Well, I talked to Lisa. That's what she grew up with. She grew up with her dad disciplining her and then saying, we're okay. I was upset, but I just want you to know now we're okay. And I never thought that I would be comparing my father-in-law to God, but that's what I'm doing. God disciplines us and God says, we're okay. I'm not, you're not in trouble. I love you and you're, you're Okay. So that's what gets revealed through the rest of this parable. And so it says in verse five, and when he found it, he's gone after the lost sheep. And when he found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. He doesn't grab the sheep and shake it by its ears. You dumb, stupid, wayward sheep. Get back to the, you know, flock. He throws it up on his shoulders and he rejoices as he brings it back. How does he respond to you when you come back to him? How does he respond to someone who's trapped in a, a downward spiral in sin? He rejoices when you come to him. And if you have walked away from him, into, he rejoices when you come back. He goes on to say, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. And I, um, and I say to you, likewise, there will be joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. That's the point of the parable. Yes, it's that he goes after lost people, but the point is, is once he brings you back, he's rejoicing. And so you may have 99 faithful Christians and heaven's just like, yep, they're faithful. Yep, they're doing their job. They're doing what they're supposed to do. Yep, there they are. They're faithful. One guy comes back and the angels are like, yes, the guy came back. That, again, I should have just taught the prodigal son today, too. But that, again, is the prodigal son. The prodigal son's all upset. Well, you never killed the fatted calf for me. Yeah, but, but, but my son's come back home. There's rejoicing from it. Now, the point of the woman who loses the coin, which is the next parable, is the same point. That's why they're put together here. That's why Jesus put them together. This is verse 8. Or what, um, or what woman having 10 silver coins if she loses one of them, or if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, 
Search carefully until she finds it. Again, this is a type of God looking for you if you have walked away for whatever reason. He's going to diligently look for you. And it says, and when she finds it, she calls her friends, her neighbors together saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. The point of the parable again is rejoicing. Let me just jump ahead a little bit to the prodigal son again. You guys like, right, you should have taught it. So there's a song um, by Benny Hester called When God Ran. You'll know it if you were around in the 70s during Christian music. It's a great song. And I listened to it yesterday. I couldn't find Benny Hester's version, but I found a version by Craig Phillips. And I think Craig Phillips from Craig Phillips and Dean, remember them? Uh, I think that he wrote this song and Benny Hester ended up cutting it and it became more popular through Benny, uh, Benny Hester's uh, version. But here's, what, here's the, the chorus of the song. He ran to me. The song's called The Only Time I Saw God Run. He ran to me. He took me in his arms, held my head to his chest, said my son's come home again. He lifted my face, wiped the tears from my eyes, and with forgiveness in his voice, he said, son, my son, do you know I still love you? That's the point of the prodigal son, the father who falls weeping on his son's neck. That's the point of the first two parables, a God who rejoices when someone that has walked away has come back. And it's incredibly powerful. Now, I don't know how, whether you know many people that are walking away from the Lord these days, but we are living in the last days. And I believe that. And I think I can make a case for that if we took time for me to make a case that we're living in the last days. There's a lot of reasons why I think that. And I, and I will do that because we're heading towards Matthew 21. And when we get to Matthew 21, we're going to be talking about all that stuff. Okay. But one of the things about the last days is the Bible says that there are going to be people that have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. And these people that have a form of godliness but deny the power are lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasures, and it goes on to give this list of what these people are. And then it says in 2 Thessalonians that before the great and terrible day of the Lord, there's going to be a great falling away. And I believe we're living in that day. There are, there are Christians who are walking away. There are Christians that write our songs. Believers, and a lot of the songs we sing that are very powerful and they have deconstructed their faith. They, they no longer believe. There are authors that have written books that have ministered to us and they're deconstructing their faith. And it's not just happening on that level. And I would like you guys, I want to obviously apply it here to those of you here who may be away for whatever reason, but also that we know people who are, have walked away or trapped in sin or deliberately walked away and that we would be committed to praying for them and, and pray, praying that God would do whatever he has to do to bring them back. And, and I think we probably all know someone who used to walk with Christ who doesn't walk with them anymore. If, if you don't, you're going to be, you're rare. Most of us know somebody. So we're going to spend time praying for them in our study today. And I do want to give you an opportunity if you're away for whatever reason. And you don't have to be way far away, but, but you've just walked away from God for you to be able to come back to him today and this is the case for those of you who may never have made a commitment to Christ and those of you who need to come back and make that commitment. And, and I love that God does things like this. There may very well be someone here. You're here for the first time or you haven't come to church for a while and you've walked away. You decided to come back to church. And here I am talking about the prodigal son, talking about you coming back. God's, God's coming after you. All right. Don't run from him anymore. It'd be better for you just to come right now. All right. Stand with me with you and let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the richness of your word as we consider your heart for the prodigal, your heart for the sinner. Forgive us when as a church, we convey an idea that you are angry with sinners instead of like a doctor who comes for the sick. You compare sinners to sick people. They, they are trapped and bound by sin and you want to set them free. And so Lord, I pray you would bring back your people today do the work of that good shepherd. And we thank you for this in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.